Hi, everyone. So many people wonder, hey, are we there yet? By there yet, I mean at the very end of the age. Is this it? Are we there? How do we know if we're there or not? Or very close to it? And how is this time different from any other time that people 500 years ago, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, 1,000 years ago believe they were in the very end time because there were famines and earthquakes and temples being burned down, persecution and so on going on, wars and rumors of wars, uh, severe persecution, the Spanish Inquisition and so on. So how is the time we're in today any different, very different from those times? And I want to talk about that today and also what's going to, what you can be looking forward to uh, to happen before Messiah returns. So this is part two. Part two of the two-part teaching, are we at the very end of the age? And what can we expect? And how do we have any peace with all these troubling things that we're told are coming? So just before we start, though, on this part two, I want to remind you all, at least as I give this in early April 2022, Passover is here, almost here. And I'll be giving some sermons and blogs. I already have a couple on Passover, on unleavened bread and, and Passover itself. So please be checking those out and um, be ready. Be, be uh, taking Passover this year in a very worthy manner. So don't get distracted by all the world news, what's happening in Ukraine, Russia, and all of that. And uh, uh, let's, let's focus really hard on Yeshua. Let's celebrate our Messiah. Let's love him. Let's love Father in heaven. I hope you have that kind of relationship, that you feel that intimacy with your Savior and Father in heaven and delight in being in relationship with him. Not just the knowledge of the truth, not just information, but him. So we're very happy to be the bride, that we are the bridegroom's uh, uh, bride-to-be. Uh, and, and we're very happy with that relationship. And so we try to seek him and get as close to him as much as we can, seek his leadership, seek obedience to him. And God, by the way, as we come to Passover, I want to remind you, just before we get into this sermon, God places such enormous value on each of us. I know there are verses that talk about all the nations are as nothing, but as far as when it came down to it, saving us, he placed the ultimate price tag on your redemption, which was the death, the life and death of his son. You may be sure to be watching the, the sermons I'll be having on or the teachings. And please feel free to register. We're working on making it simple. If it doesn't quite work for you the first time, come back a week later. Uh, we're, we're working on making it simple to register, to log in, to leave comments. It's so inspiring and encouraging to the writers and speakers, uh, and to me too, uh, when, when I see people making comments or questions. That really helps. Anyway, so this is part two or two-part teaching. Are we at the end of the age? And I just want to cover how and why we think uh, we're there. First of all, what makes it so different? Excuse me, I've got to reach something. I can't quite see it. Okay, how and why we think we're there, or within a decade, certainly, I think, of the return of Yeshua. Yeshua said no man knows the day or the hour. He didn't say no one knows the approximate time. But he said the day or the hour, we, we just don't know. That's in the Father's hands. And what's going to happen before he lands on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem, according to his own words? So, um, you know, last time we talked about Matthew 24, the first three verses, how the disciples were taking Yeshua around the temple complex. Look how stunningly beautiful this temple building is and the artwork and the stonework and the jewels and the gold. How incredibly beautiful, and it, was, and it was. And he kind of dampened that a little bit by saying, the time is coming when there won't be two stones upon each other. And it's all going to be torn down. And so then from there, they went down the gully we call the Kidron Valley and up the east side to Mount of Olives. They've been there a couple of times, spent many, many days and hours in that area. Uh, I was part of an archaeological dig and just loved going there. But anyway, so then... Uh, they came back to him and they asked him the questions that what will be the sign? Well, Matthew 24 in verse 3. Let me just read that first. Matthew 24 verse 3. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him and, and privately 
asking him, tell us, when will these things be? When are the no two stones going to be on each other? And what will be the sign of your coming, a separate question, and of the end of the age? All right. So we'll be talking about that today in far more detail. I want to just remind you that I hope you have seen the uh, uh, first part. Uh, and by the way, where it says end of the age, if you go by King James, uh, maybe a couple others, it will say King uh, end of the end of the world. It doesn't mean the planets disappearing. The better translation from the Greek word aeon is age, where we get an age, a time period. And uh, right now we're in the age of man and Satan's rulership. He's the God of this world. And that's going to come to an end. And the age of Messiah is coming. And what will be the end of this world's age? So last time we covered the first four seals of Revelation 6. The false prophets, the war, the famine, and then the shortages, inflation, and, 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 and happening. And then a fourth of the world, uh, if, the, if the wording there means what it says, a fourth of the world will die. That's like almost two billion people from famines and war and hunger and beasts and so on. Revelation 6 verse 8. I also gave examples of how the whole world dramatically changed in the last couple of years. Dramatically. Through the COVID and how they got emergency powers and changed everything all around the world. I explained last time, also it does seem, since we're in the worst time ever about to happen, uh, that there will be protection given to many of God's children, not all, but he's promised protection for some of those who are zealous and seeking him and so on. But many will be martyrs, including, by the way, it's not always bad to be a martyr. Most of the 12 apostles were martyrs, except John. Um, and the two witnesses at the very end time will be killed also. So if, you're, if you see that you're there, you're going to get killed, you're going to get persecuted or hurt, for God's sake, for his sake, for his love, and for everything he's done for us, be faithful to the end, even unto death. And pray for help for that. And pray for me that I have help with that. We talked a little bit about the war in Ukraine. Much, much more. So be sure you watch that. Please be sure. So going on, at, at the temple of, we call it Herod's temple. Yeshua called it my father's house. So uh, remember the disciples had remarked about the stones not standing on each other and so forth. And um, we'll, we'll have pictures of, of that temple at some point in here. And also pictures of uh, Mount of Olives, which is really just a big hill. You go down the Kidron Valley, not that deep. And then up the other side, that's Mount of Olives. And tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age. It's not the end of the world, like I said. Now much of the space taken up by prophecy, by prophecy, is about our end time. It's about these last 10 to 20 years before Christ returns. I really believe it's very possible that Yeshua could be standing on the Mount of Olives with us and we with him in 10 years or less than 10 years. If I'm wrong, great, it's fine. It's up to, up to Father. But it can't be much more than 10 or 15, 20 years. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure of it. And uh, we've read the end of the book that no matter how bad it gets, it, it, it comes out fine. God, God wins. But much of the space is taken up on our time period. You and I should be excited about that. Yeah, we don't want to see the, the worst time of trouble the world's ever seen. But at the same time, there's, one, there's, a, there's a, a passage that says, look up, your redemption draws nigh. But I want to I read this first, Luke 21, verses 10 and 11. You and I are living at the time of world history happening. You and I might even be part of the making of it, or at least an observer of all of it. And you and I uh, should be excited about that. Luke 21, verses 10 and 11. He said to them, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. <clears throat> and there will be great earthquakes in various places, famines and pandemics, pestilences. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. We're going to see things coming down from the sky because the Bible in other places says God's going to shake the heavens. And just like a, 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 a fruit tree or a walnut tree or something, it's shaken heavily and, and it all falls down. The heavens are going to be shaken. We're going to be seeing fearsome sights and pandemics. If you think COVID-19 was bad, that was just warm-up. 
We're going we're gonna to have times when we'll have two, three, four pandemics going on at the same time. At the same time. And this pandemic we've just been through was, some say as little as half of 1% mortality, lethality, up to 2%. No more than that. No more than that. People don't even panic anymore when they hear someone's got the, the COVID positive test. I mean, uh, my sister, my brother's had it. And, 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 you know, we haven't yet had it. But um, Pelosi was just announced as having it. I'm sure she's all booster shot and they're boosted and all that, but she still got it. But anyway, my point is, imagine a pandemic with 85% lethality. Imagine if some of those uh, horrible disease-causing war weapon that they are developing in the labs gets out that has a 50, 60, 80% or more lethality. We have yet to see that. And I think that's what it's talking about in Revelation 6, 8, when a fourth of the world will be killed. So why are we covering it? Because for one thing, people want to know if we're there yet. Even the disciples wanted to know. And Yeshua, Jesus answered that. Ezekiel 33, the first nine verses or so, uh, say that watchmen, if they see something coming and don't say anything, the blood will be on their heads. And so God has revealed these things to us in his word. Uh, if I'm a watchman, I need to be speaking out. If I'm, if I'm, an out, if I'm a lookout on, a, on, on the crow's nest of the Titanic and I see in the distance, I don't mean just before you hit it, but enough time to make some changes in the uh, speed and destination of direction of the ship. Hey, there's a big iceberg out there. I don't care if people say don't scare us. I've got to say it. I've got to say it because of what God says in Ezekiel 33. The blood will be on your heads if you don't say something. So from my point of view, I've got to say something. And it's also to remind us of how to have peace in these scary times that are coming. You and I have to grow to where no matter what's happening, we thank God knowing that all things work together for good, even as bad as it can be at times. We thank God and thank God and thank God. And that's why it says in Philippians 4 that in all things, in everything, bring your request to God with thanksgiving. And the peace of God that surpasses understanding will come upon you. And also, um, these are the words of Yeshua himself. In Luke 21, verse 9, Luke 21 is a parallel chapter to Matthew 24. <clears throat> when you hear of wars and commotions, rumors of wars, do not be terrified. That's our marching orders. Those are our marching orders. Do not be terrified. For these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. So anyway, we know we're in great hands. We're in God's hands, even if he allows us to be persecuted, to be attacked, to be killed, our family killed in front of our eyes. No matter what it is, you heard me right. No matter what it is, we have to thank God for everything and trust him. John 14, 27 was said by the one, Jesus, Yeshua, who would within 24 hours of this be dead and scourged, crucified, and all of that. He said, less than 24 hours, John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. John 14, 27, not as the world gives you, do I give it to you. Let not your heart be troubled. Don't let yourself get scared. Neither let it be afraid. Don't let it happen. Isaiah 26, verse 3 and 4, will post up here also. You will keep him in perfect peace. In perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. Because he trusts in you. Trust in Jehovah forever, for in Yah, Jehovah is everlasting strength. Yah is the shortened form of Yehovah. And uh, some people don't like us using those words, and yet they'll every day say hallelujah, which is Hebrew for let's all praise God. Let's all praise Yah. Okay, hallelujah. You're saying the name God said is his name, Yehovah, at, at that very moment. So anyway, trust in him, focus on him. And I want to say this too. What if you die? Or what if someone you love very deeply dies? It's always difficult. 
let's face it, I've had a son die. All my parents, grandparents, cousins, a lot of cousins, a lot of all my uncles and aunts have died. And uh, I had a sister die, a son die. I know what peace you get when your son dies and you get beside the bed, beside his dead body. Say, Father, I don't fully understand it yet, but he's in your hands. You know what? I thank you for him, the time you let me have with him. And it works. It really does work. But anyway, what if, we, what if someone you love does die? Isaiah 51 verse, Isaiah 57 verse 1, I like the New Living Translation, the way it puts it here. Good people pass away. Isaiah 57 1. The godly often die before their time. No one seems to care or wonder why. No one seems to understand that God is protecting them from the evil to come. Isaiah 57 1. God is protecting them from the evil to come. There's another verse in Psalm that says precious in the, in the sight of God are the, is the death of his saints. Precious. So no matter what happens, including death, because it's going to be some pretty rough times ahead, we have to be at peace. Quit worrying. Worry doesn't help you. Makes it worse. I want to read this. Luke 21, 25 to 28. And we will have it posted up there even before I get to it here. So hopefully you've been reading it. We should have a sense of excitement that we're in this time when our redemption draws nigh to be part of world history. There will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars. Luke 21, 25 to 28. And on the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Tsunamis it's talking about here. Men's hearts failing them from fear and the expectation of the things which are coming to the earth. People are having heart attacks and strokes and things. For the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Then you'll see, or they will see, the Son of Man, that's Jesus, Yeshua, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Other places say he'll flash like lightning from east to west, all around the world. Every eye will see him. Now when these things begin to happen, look up, look up, lift up your heads. Because your redemption draws near. Look up. This can be a very, very exciting time. It can also be terrifying. Remember who you are, though. You're the beloved bride of Jesus Christ, who will be the one marrying the bride. And we are the children of our beloved Father. They love you more than you'll ever understand. So no matter what they let you go through, it's only for our good. There's a verse in Romans 5, around verse 3 or 4, that says glory in tribulations because it, it brings about perseverance. And perseverance brings about character. And character brings hope, if I said it in the right order there. But glory in troubles, troubles sometimes. Glory in it. Be happy about it. James says that. Rejoice in your trials. So, but as we look at these things about to happen, be nimble. I used to call it riding loose in the saddle. What I mean is don't, don't just stick to your old things that you're always taught 30, 40 years ago and are unwilling to, to change. As we, things cha as we see ch things, blah, let's start over. <laughs> as we see things changing, we should be willing to be nimble and move our understanding a bit. Otherwise, you might miss something entirely if you're glued to old predictions and old understanding and old explanations. Somebody I love very much says she can't keep her old Bible from 50 years ago. All the margin notes are outdated now and many of them are wrong. So God is a way of giving us an overview. And then as we get closer and closer, the details are surprising to us. And uh, so don't get locked in on one view. Please don't. Because no prophecy of scripture is of private interpretation. 1 Peter 2.20, let's post that. No prophecy of Scripture is of private interpretation. I think that's the end of 1 Peter 2.20. Plus, please be aware and accepting of the fact that God can change his mind. He might have written the whole book of Daniel and Revelation, Matthew 24. He told Jonah, go tell the Ninevites. 40 days, their city's going to be gone. They're done for. They repented. 
God changed his mind. And we see that, in fact, many times in Scripture. And so I'm not done praying for my nation. I'm not done praying for it. If Some of you are locked in that God has to do all these things now in Revelation and all that because he said so. I'm saying, no, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. In the if my people's uh, verse that we like to use, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and if they, my people, will turn from their wicked ways, forget everybody else, you, my people, you and I have to turn from our wicked ways, you and I have to turn to him, then I will hear from heaven. It's verse 14. Verse 13, the context is, is when I, when I, God, shut the heavens, and there's no rain, and there's drought everywhere, there's famine, no, or I command the locusts to eat all the food you're growing, to devour the land, or I send pandemics, pestilence among the people. If you, my people, would get on your knees, a lot less Facebook time, a lot less Twitter time, a lot less TV time, spend more time with me, seeking me, Jehovah says, I will hear from heaven, the end of verse 14, and will forgive their sin and heal their land. So surely we do sigh and cry, we moan and groan. We feel the terrible, the terrible pain that some people in Mariupol in Ukraine are going through. Many of them are probably dead from starvation already in their rooms. Whenever if Ukraine can ever get it back, it's going to be horrifying to see what, what's in there. So we have to come before God for the crime and, the, and the, just the criminality going on in our country at all levels. You can't be distancing yourself from that. You have to sigh and cry according to Ezekiel 9. I've spoken on that many times. Ezekiel 9, the first six verses, God says, go put a mark, a tav, a mark on the forehead of, of those who are sighing and crying for the abomination and protect them from what he was. They, they were not killed by God. So we sigh and cry. We, we, we beseech God, thy kingdom come. And we pray like crazy. And I hope you're understanding. Part of my motive here is to convey to everybody, we're close, you guys. We're close. Don't be falling asleep. Yet all ten virgins slept. Remember Matthew 25? All ten, the wise even, slept. Good description of much of the church today. Slept asleep. So why are we so sure that this time it's the real thing? It's the end of the age? So my view is at the soonest it could be. It could be eight to nine, ten years. That's the soonest. There are verses that God says he will cut the time short. So he can work and maneuver things to be to work it out faster than we might think possible. We won't know the day or the hour. It won't be tonight. It won't be next month. It won't be next year. I'm talking in 2022. It could start. We could start seeing things really start hopping. If it is, in fact, in eight or nine years, things have to start hopping. And uh, but how do we know that this is it? This is the this is the timetable that is the end of the age. And I'm saying 8 to 10 years, could be 15 or 20, but I, I really, truly think we're really just about there. Revelation 11 speaks of God's two witnesses. Here's point number one. I don't hear other people talking about this as a point to prove that we are a generation that can speak with more, def more definite certainty that this is it. Is right here, Revelation 11, verses 7 to 10, talking about the two witnesses preaching in Jerusalem just before Christ's return. My point here is it says the whole world is watching them. The whole world sees them killed. The whole world celebrates. The whole world sees them resurrected. I hope we have that posted so you can be reading it. Even at this very moment in 2022, that's still not possible. There are still too many places around Africa, parts of Asia, even parts of the United States where people don't have access to Internet. We're almost there in America, but I think it was Elon Musk. Musk. It might have been someone else, uh, one of the other billionaires, 
But he, someone's up there putting hundreds and hundreds of satellites up so that the whole world can have internet. The whole world can watch and see what's going on. It's still not there. Probably by next year, 2023, 2024, it will be there. But that has never, ever happened before. Never happened before. In Revelation 11, talking about the two witnesses, uh, then in verse 9, then those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days. John's probably wondering, how on earth is that going to happen? We understand. Put a camera on that, put it on the different news works, networks. Everybody can see it. They won't allow their dead bodies to be put into graves, and those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them, make merry, send gifts to one another, and so on. Because these two prophets tormented those. They, they called for famines and, and uh, drought and different things. So that to me is proof number one. The world, even to 2022, has never been able to quite do that. We soon, very soon will. No other generation, no other year, no other time could that happen. Proof, okay? If I stopped right there, to me, that's enough. Point number two. These first two points are not points that I hear used often. The third day of Hosea 6, verses 1 and 2, is almost here. Yeshua was crucified in 30 AD. The Bible speaks of a day is like a thousand years to God. That's in 1 Peter 3, verse 8, and also Psalm 90, verse 4. You probably all know about that. If you don't, stop the, stop the video for a while and go back and look it up. In biblical days, two days is 2,000 years. From when Christ was crucified in 30 AD plus 2,000 years is 2030. Okay, keep that in mind in terms of two days. This next verse, I think, is talking about us. We're right there. Hosea 6, verses 1 and 2. Come and let us return to the Lord, to Yahweh, or Jehovah, for he has torn, but he will heal us. Yeah, he's been hitting us hard lately been letting us go through our own machinations, but he will heal us. He has stricken, but he will bind us. After two days, he will revive us. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. So starting the third day, things are going to get a whole lot better. If if, and I'm making that assumption that 30 AD, the time I feel is the crucifixion year, not 31, not 33, but 30 AD. Anyway, add 2,000 years to that. That brings us to 2030. Unless, of course, the starting point is all wrong and it's based on something else, which I'll get to next. Israel became an independent sovereign, number three. Okay, if number one was the whole world able to see the two witnesses. Number two, the third day. He will raise us up. The third day begins, as I see it, in the year 2030, upon the anniversary of the Passover. The next day starts the third day. Israel became an independent sovereign nation in, on May 14, May 14, 1948. The prophecies for the end of the age center around their being a Jerusalem and around their being an Israel. No Israel, no Jerusalem. Uh, the prophecies don't work. Jews were thrown out of their land twice. When, when Babylon, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, burned the temple on the ninth of Ab, I think it was. Um, and, 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 and anyway, my, my point is whatever date it was, I don't have it here. It's the same date exactly in 70 A.D., when it happened again. It's from God. But my point is, they returned twice. First time was 70 years after the temple burned down. Daniel remembers praying, hey, 70 years is almost here. Please make the way open for us to go back. Um, and then the second time was May 14, 1948, when the state of Israel was announced and accepted at the UN. Last time I covered how Yeshua was talking privately to his disciples about the end of the age and so much applied to the second temple and all of that. But then he says this, Matthew 24, verses 32 to 35, in reference to Israel. 
Matthew 24, 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and put forth leaves. So this is not a seed you've put, stuck in the ground. This is not a sapling. This is not some germinating, uh, sprouting little tiny fig. This is a tree with leaves. When you know the leaves are there, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all the things I've been telling you, he says, no, we're at the doors, the end of the age. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. The fig tree, everyone knows, was a symbol of Israel. In Micah 4.4, 4, it says everyone will sit under his vine and his fig tree. The olive tree, the, the vine, the fig tree, and the olive tree were all symbols of Israel. Maybe I'll write a blog on that to explain it further. <clears throat> I think the fig tree seed was planted in 1897 in Switzerland when the Zionist movement began, and then it began to sprout by the time you got to 1917, the Balfour Declaration from Britain, uh, when they stated that their goal was to make Israel a sovereign state, that be it sprouting so more or less, no leaves yet. And finally, on May 14, 1948, the fig leaves sprouted, Israel became a nation, and over time, the things that Yeshua said to watch for have been happening. So he says, when you see the fig tree, so Israel's back in the land. This generation will by no means pass. Remember, he, he talked about the destruction of the temple first. From 30 AD, when he said that, to 70 AD, after the Christ's death, 70 AD is 40 years. And so was he saying that the generation alive, when he said that, would there still be many of them still alive in 70 AD? They were born in 29 or 30 AD. Many of them are only 40 years old, 41, 42 years old. And then the temple was destroyed. This generation won't pass till it happens. So part of that applied to the first coming and the first and the second temple being destroyed. But what about the rest? All the signs of the end of the age. Let's go to Psalm 90, verse 10. What's a generation? In the Bible, you can see that a generation can vary anywhere from 20 years to 40 years to uh, 70, 80, or 100. In Psalm 90, verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years. I know if I like that verse. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'll be 69 soon. And if by reason of strength they are 80 years, yet their boast is only for uh, labor and sorrow. Anyway, he's saying, uh, he's saying our lives are 70 to 80 years. Some interpret that to be a generation. So 80 years from 1948 takes us to 2028. 1948 to 2028. However, if you take the interpretation meaning that anyone born in 1948, there will still be people alive. There will still be people alive when Christ returns from who were born in 1948. We have people routinely living today to 90, 95, 100. So I'm not saying it has to be. Please hear me. I'm not setting a firm date. I don't want you all calling me a false prophet. Or I'm not prophesying anything. I'm telling you what looks to be something to be watching. If 2030 doesn't pan out, is it possible that it could be as long as 2048? It's still not long a long time from now. But anyway, that's if people live to be 100 past 1948. Okay? The fig tree, again, it pictures Israel. So number three sign is those who came before 1948, and we're saying that we're in the end times now, the 1930s and 1920s or 1500s or 1300s, there was no Israel. No, it wasn't the end of the age yet. Number four, if God does not intervene to stop the world's action, no flesh will be saved alive. It's, it says, as you see in Matthew 24, verse 22, and unless those days are shortened after this great tribulation, no flesh will be saved. He means alive, saved alive. For, but for the elect's sake, for you, because of you, because of you and me, who are precious in God's eyes. 
those days will be shortened. What does that mean? So we might think it's got to be 2030, it's got to be 2048, it's got to be 2067. It could be any number of these dates people are... God can say, you know what? If I don't intervene, no, no flesh will be saved alive. And let me just say right now, too, some people are saying that we're already in the Great Tribulation and have been since 2017 because of their calculations. I guarantee you we're not. We're not yet in anywhere near... We're not in the, we might be near, but we're not in the Great Tribulation yet. That's described as the worst time of trouble the world's ever seen. Daniel 12, verse 1 and 2. Matthew 24, uh, the one we just read. Uh, the verse before the one we just read. Then there'll be Great Tribulation, such as the world's never seen. So we're at that point, though, where we could destroy everybody on earth many times over just by the... Um, uh, nuclear bombs we have and all of that. Okay, so those days will be shortened, yet Scripture also speaks, a contrast that it's also possible that there's, there, there will be a delay. If you go back to Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, verse 5 says, while the bridegroom was delayed. While the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. I will posit this for all of you. Is it possible that delay there was? There really was a delay, but that it's already happened. I think that's possible. So what's left to happen now is the time will be cut short. So you guys need to listen. We all need to be repenting, seeking God, waking ourselves up, asking God to wake us up. We all need to be spending more time in God's Word. We all need to. Brethren, please. We all need to be doing this. So how close are we to the end time? I think the closest might be 2028, 2030. It could be later than that. But if that's true, and it's that close, hear me out, then a lot of big things have to start soon. The famines, the death toll of a fourth of the world's population in, in uh, seal number four. That's two billion people. Talk about powerful pandemics and war and all that. Starting to build a new temple. Where is it? I will remind you that the Prime Minister of Israel, Naftali Bennett, is a, an Orthodox Jew and he's already stated that he wants to make it a priority to start the temple, get it going within three years. To me, three years is almost too late for the, for the math to work out. But he certainly wants to build that temple. So are we already in the Great Tribulation? No. It's going to be a whole lot worse than what we're seeing right now. This isn't even close to the Spanish Inquisition. And yet it's going to be the worst time the world has ever seen. And we believers have to wake up. Peter said that since we know all these things are about to happen, he says we should be, what manner of people we should be, 1 Peter 3, or 2 Peter 3, I mean 2 Peter 3 verses 10 to 12, 10 to 11, 2 Peter 3, 10 to 11, see what manner of people we should be in holiness and godly conduct, hastening the day of the Lord. So the bride of Christ must be getting ready and be ready, and I hope we are. Now some more things to be watching for as we get close to the end of the age. I did cover the first four seals last time. There's no doubt in my mind, personally, that the first three seals have opened up. I think we're right there at the fourth seal about to be opened. Remember again, I explained how you have a scroll. And as you open and roll out that scroll, you come to a place where it's been had some glue of some kind, uh, candle, candle drops or something that would seal that spot. You can't open it until you break it open, break it open, and then continue to pull it out. That seal stays open once it's pulled out. As the seals are open, they remain open, okay? As the seals are broken. So when we experience seal number four, the first three, famine and war and all that, will still be continuing. But the famine and the war will cause extreme inflation and 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 
uh, we'll, have a, we'll have problems finding food. It says in Revelation 6, verse 5 and 6, about the third seal. There's a black horse. He had scales in his hand. And he says, a quart of wheat for a day's wages. A denarius is a day's wages. So you figure out what a day's wage is. If the average wage is 20 or 30 bucks times eight, you're over 200 bucks. Over 200 bucks for a quart of wheat. So he's talking about inflation here as well because there'll be so little food around, it's going to be expensive. The famines of the third seal could start this year, 2022, or certainly next year. Even President Biden is already warning us all that we're coming into a time of food shortages. That's what he calls famine. Food shortages. Right here in America, let alone the rest of the world. And, and why is that? Because certainly if God, especially if God also sends uh, acts of God, this natural disasters, hurricanes, floods, droughts, wildfires, tornadoes that keep us from planting and harvesting here in America, the breadbasket of the world on so many things. Ukraine was called the breadbasket of Europe. Just, just Ukraine's lack of production alone will mean a lot of people in Ukraine and around Ukraine, France and Germany and Poland, a lot of them took wheat and barley and things and corn out of Ukraine. Certainly the Middle East did as well. Pandemics keep us from planting and harvesting. The price of fertilizer, most of the world's fertilizer, comes from Russia and China and Ukraine. Most of it. And the price of fertilizer just in the last year has gone up eight to ten times. In fact, from just six months ago, eight to ten times higher. So the cost of food from just buying the fertilizer and the cost of transporting everything because for some reason we won't use our own natural gas and oil that we have, which I think is really dumb. If we have enough for our own use, we were energy independent under President Trump. And now we're seeing gas prices it was $2.38 a gallon. Now in California it's over $7 a gallon. It's around 4 to $5 a gallon in many other parts of, of the country. In just one year, that's going to go way up. So the price of delivering food and getting everything to you. China has just bought $2 billion worth of American farmland in the last few years. $2 billion bought dollars worth. Why are we doing that? So expect rationing. Expect ID cards. And then seal number four will be a cascading series of wars, pandemics, and earthquakes. I'm full of joy, huh? I am. Because my joy is in, in Yeshua. My joy is in Jesus Christ. My joy is in my Father. And I trust him, and I have peace of mind that no matter what's going to go on, we do our part. We certainly, uh, the biggest thing is to trust God, but also do your part. Be storing up now, be, be saving up some food, putting it places. Make sure you have food, make sure you have extra water. I always keep, it's not that much, but it'll keep me around, keep us in water for a few weeks. Make sure you have good, clean, potable water, drinkable water. Revelation 6, verse 7 and 8 talks about a fourth of the earth being killed. That's close to 2 billion. So be ready for that. Do your part to be ready for that. Get out of debt. Get out of debt as much as you can. Some of you will disagree with that. But I think if you have no debt and your house is paid for and, 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 and you have some food and water stored up and you have energy stored up, stored up, have some extra gasoline or petrol, as some of you would call it. You can last a while while things get, while well, you get used to the change of conditions. So what else has to happen? Have you watched and felt a filthiness around the whole world the last two years that you never noticed quite that bad before? I think Satan's ugly, horrible spirit is being allowed it's being allowed by God to spread out. Because it's time of the end now. That evil demonic spirit will get worse and worse. None of you, none of you should ever be involved in Dungeons and Dragons and Harry Potter or anything to do with witchcraft, sorcery, and demonic stuff. None of you should be. If you have been, repent of it. Stop. None of you should have a Ouija board in your home. 
If you do, burn it. Get, it. get rid of it. Don't be fooling around with these powers. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. So we're not afraid of them. But don't fool with them. Satan hates the family. That's the other thing that you'll see more and more since 2015 when they redefined marriage, not being between one man and one woman, but between anybody. And so as a result of that, people don't even know what a man is, what a boy is. There's no more boys and girls bathrooms in some places. No more boys and girls locker rooms and shower rooms. The boys might like that. Some of the girls might like that, frankly, to be honest with you. But when we're so confused that the newly appointed judge on the, on the Supreme Court refused to define woman, she wouldn't even be there if it weren't for the fact that she is a woman. President Biden said the only consideration he would have for that spot, and this is, this is racism and this is, this is a bias at its worst, is to say we're not going to pick the very best person, man or woman, whatever color, to fill that spot. I want a black woman. So anybody else who wasn't black, any of the Hispanics, any of the whites, any of the men, any of the other women who weren't black, were cut out. But anyway, she would not define woman. And yet the only reason she's there is because she's a woman. Isn't that something? This confusion is straight from the enemy and is destroying our family. Now that's led also to this confusion about gender. We don't know who's a boy, who's a girl. And now the, the, the left want to be able to teach your children, kindergarten, grade one, grade two, and three, uh, to, to, to worry about whether if they're a girl, if they really should have been a boy, and vice versa. And really confuse them. This is leading to a lot of people, a lot of young, youngsters, committing suicide in their confusion. Suicide. So um, there's a book by, I forget her first name, Schreier, uh, Irredeemable, I think it's called, uh, something like that. But anyway, it's also setting the stage for the little kids to grow up not, not trusting mom and dad, who probably don't even know that they're being told these things in school. You know, we, we, we have our grandkids. Uh, my, my daughter has, she's homeschooling. I mean, and she misses all of this stuff because of homeschooling. She doesn't have to worry about people shooting other students in school. She doesn't have to worry about drug dealing. She doesn't have to worry about her kids being taught about their gender being wrong or whatever. So it sets it up for, Ma for Mark 13, 12. Now brother will betray brother to death, a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. Your children can cause you to be put to death if they're so indoctrinated by the way this leftist government in much of the world, Australia, Canada, Britain, France, America, so much of the world, New Zealand, we're all, we're all there. Not quite all countries. Okay, so that's another thing, is the family and the gender and all that. And another thing we'll be, keep watching is the bride of Christ must be ready to marry the Son of God. We must be dressed in bright, fine, white linen of righteousness, that righteousness, remember, it says, is granted to her. The fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Your Bible probably says is the righteous acts of the saints. The word acts is not in the original. It actually says, as, as correctly in, in the King James in this, in this instance, and uh, Noah Webster translation, the Darby translation, the only three I could find that had it right, where it says, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, Revelation 19.8, clean and white or clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. The fine linen, which was granted to her, it says earlier there. Because our righteousness is not my acts. My righteousness is given me by God. I have a sermon called God's Perfection for Us, God's Way. Please hear those, that two-part teaching. It's granted to her, okay? And uh, let's be sure to dedicate ourselves more than ever that we're going to obey God and be close to him, let him work in us. The bride, though, has to be ready. I don't see Christ returning unless the bride is ready. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
Next, I do believe, I mentioned this last time, I'll mention it again, a, a third temple, I believe is well on the way. It's not started yet, although uh, the accoutrements, the, the, the clothing, the, the priestly robes, the menorah, maybe we can show a series of pictures as I'm talking about this here. I took some when I was in Israel. I've spent months in Israel, many months. And um, they have a menorah, solid gold, ready to go. They have the, the lyre, the harps, they have the shofars, they have the table of uh, bread, you know, the, the, the showbread, and um, the altar of incense. All of that's ready. All of that's ready. They have found priests, have the right DNA to be part of uh, Aaron's line. They're all in training for it. The only thing we don't have so far is the building. I believe it is going to be a building based on 2 Thessalonians 2 that this man of sin is going to be in this temple of God. Now you might say, how can that be the temple of God? Well, even Herod's temple, Yeshua himself, Jesus himself said, this is my father's house. How dare you make it a den of thieves? Okay? But anyway, he'll be in the temple. And the Greek word there is not tent, is not tabernacle, is not even the temple complex. He'll be in the temple, naos, N-A-O-S, meaning the sacred parts where the Holy of Holies is and where the sanctuary is and all that. And Prime Minister Bennett is dedicated, has committed himself to having a third temple. And so God will have to intervene to make that possible without causing World War III. He'll have to change the hearts and minds and he'll have to reveal exactly where it should be. Many of you feel you know where it should be. I just say God will put it in the minds of the people because where a lot of people think it should be, I'll tell you, the top Israeli leaders and archaeologists totally scoff at that other notion of where it should be. God will have to reveal where it is. We might even see part of it be the Dome of the Rock and next to it, the temple. A lot of you will disagree with me on that. It's fine. We'll see what God does. Animal sacrifices will have to be in play, I think, about seven years. And then halfway through, it's cut down. Uh, Daniel 9 goes into all of that. And um, they're practicing now. They have the red heifers now, from what I've heard, from what I've read. Uh, the red heifers are young red cows, heifers, young cows, that are killed and burned. And then the ashes from that is part of the several things that go into the sprinkling to cleanse people and the temple and the altar and different things. They have that. So the stage is set. All they need now is the building. I will, I personally believe the stones, the big blocks of stones have been cut out and are being stored someplace. I really do. I have no proof of that. Um, I have some things I don't want to say here, but I, I, I think that's already happening. We're going to see new world orders and power struggles evolve and, and grow. Uh, Russia-China coalition. You're going to see, now that America is not the single supreme power around the world, it, it's gone. You're going to see nature of whores of vacuum. You see Turkey popping up. You, you see Iran trying to be powerful. You see Europe coming, trying to come together. And uh, Eurasian and so forth, different, different parts of the world. The U.S. is no longer going to be the dominant power. Our military is already the smallest it's been since 1940. And we're mothballing 28 more ships. All we have is 250 ships. China has more than double that. The U.S. dollar is likely to crash soon. Maybe in a year or two or five, but it will crash. And when it crashes, the money won't be worth anything. It won't be worth much. Inflation will eat up what you have on top of that. Russia is now letting other countries buy their oil and coal and gas, but only in Russian rubles. Saudi Arabia, angry at Biden for letting Iran have a door open for a nuclear bomb, won't even take his phone calls. Saudi Arabia wants Xi Jinping, China, to come over and kind of rubbing it in Biden's face. And he's told China, you can pay for our oil in your Chinese money and the yuan. I mean, so all of this is already weakening the U.S. dollar or setting the stage for it to collapse like a house of cards. The cracks are showing up. You add to that natural acts of God. And you add to that something called the WEF. I'd like you all to read and study and learn about it. The World Economic Forum, led by Klaus Schwab and a bunch of elites 
that are being trained by them. And uh, he wrote a book called COVID-19, uh, The Great Reset, how that was going to be used around the world to get the world ready for chaos, to get the world ready. You know, leaders like wars and they like chaos because in chaos and wars, you, you, you get to uh, call martial law. You get to do, look at what they did up in Canada. Look what look what uh, Trudeau did up in Canada. I mean, they seized the bank accounts of anyone even helping the truckers who were peacefully trying to speak peacefully. Freedom of speech. They lost it up there. But anyway, I'll, I'll put in my notes a link that you can watch. It's not very long about Klaus Schwab, the, the, the leader of, of uh, be watching that name, Klaus, K-L-A-U-S, Schwab. And um, they want disasters and chaos. I think personally they're causing a lot of that uh, so that people will beg for a strong man, someone to come on the scene and take over things. The beast power is not set up yet, but the stage is being set. The time for the fall of USA is coming. And Europe's going to come up, and, it's, and there's going to be a 10 nation. And uh, Daniel 2 talks about it being a mixture of iron and clay. And iron is strong and clay is not. I think it's going to be a mixture of the stronger Western European countries, like Germany, and the Eastern not-so-strong country countries, maybe Slovakia or, or, or Poland or some others that aren't, aren't quite as strong. Well, Poland's not that bad, though. But the beast has to show up. The, the beast, the leader of the beast system, is a man. And the Bible says in Revelation 11, 7 and Revelation 17, 8, let's put those up there, that this beast comes out, ascends from the bottomless pit also called the abyss in some, some translations. Do you remember when Jesus cast out the demons out of the, the man named Legion? A, a legion could be as high as 6,000 6, people or demons. There are many inside of them. And they begged him, please, don't let us go to the abyss. Don't send us to the bottomless pit where all those really bad dudes, the really bad demons are. Don't do it. So he put them in a bunch of pigs that went, you know, running towards the cliff. In Revelation 17, 8, the beast that you saw that was will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition. What does that mean? That this human leader ascends from the bottomless pit? Does it mean that the one inspiring him? That might be the easiest explanation. The one inspiring him as a terrible demon uh, might maybe Satan himself but probably a terrible demon because Satan seems to be the one that goes into the great false prophet. But anyway, or does it mean that this beast power, again, I don't know about this. I'm just, I'm just saying be nimble, ride loose in the saddle, be willing to think outside the box. Could it be that this beast power isn't even totally human? Could it be that? I'm just throwing it out there. What does it mean that he ascends out of the bottomless pit where these horrific demons are? So it could be that he's not 100% human as we might think. So be nimble there. The false prophet is a great religious leader. Now these people, I'm convinced, are alive today. They're out there somewhere. The beast, if he comes out of the bottomless pit, may not be around yet. But these others are. And so... Um, if that great beast power has superhuman capabilities, that would also explain why people are enthralled by him. But the, gate, the great false prophet seems to be one in Revelation 13 that unites all the peoples and all the nations, all the tribes and all the tongues to worship this beast, the beast system. And that beast system will be wounded, a mortal wound that's healed, not mortal, comes back to life. That's all in Revelation 13. You guys got to be studying these chapters. And read them and reread them and reread them until you understand the book of Revelation more. At least the, the wording becomes familiar and you'll start to see their revelations, uh, the, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The great false prophet, again, think outside the box. Does not have to be a pope necessarily. Might be the pope. May not be the pope. Maybe somebody else who 
isn't so tied into Christianity. Maybe someone else who can bring Christianity and the Buddhists and the Muslims and the Hindus all together to some extent for a short time. Just be aware it doesn't may not have to be, as some of you insist on it having to be the Pope. But I will think you'll see this Pope doing his best to bring the, the children, the protesters, out of the mother church. The, he'll, he'll try to reunite with the Anglicans and the Lutherans and the, um, and the Ukrainian Orthodox, the Russian Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox. So be watching for that. They won't be in power for long. They really won't. So again, the beast refers to the union of nations. I believe that's going to be Europe. And then the false prophet. We don't know who that is. They're probably alive today. Jerusalem, another point, has to be retaken from the Jews, trodden down by Gentiles for 42 months. We know at some point, Luke 21, 20, says that Jerusalem will be surrounded by armies. Surrounded by armies. Again, think outside the box. The Bible says these armies can cause desolation. So it doesn't sound very friendly. But what if they came in first as a peacekeeping force? Not bad dudes, but a peacekeeping force who become bad dudes once they're there. Keep your eyes open. Keep your options open. Be nimble. Ride loose in the saddle. Just be watching. And just before Christ returns, there will be two witnesses of God, I've mentioned them already, preaching in Jerusalem. Who are they? We don't know yet. They probably won't show up until three and a half years before Christ returns. One, they'll be, they're not Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah are dead. No one's ascended to heaven, John 3, 13. All of these died, okay, not having received the promises, Hebrews 11, okay? It won't be Moses and Elijah. But whoever they are, they could well be the type, doing the types of miracles that Moses and Elijah did. Might be two Jews, or might be a Jew and a Gentile. Might not be anyone from your church at all. Probably not anyone from your church. And if Christ is coming between, between 8 and 20 years from now, they're probably alive today somewhere out there. I have no idea who they are. No one does. Although I got a phone call just a couple weeks ago from somebody who insisted that he wanted me to come out and meet with the two witnesses, that he knows who they are, and uh, I need to meet them, and he wanted me to meet them. And I, I don't know, it all sounded kind of weird to me, and I just did not want to get involved in it. But they probably are alive today. But they, we won't see them preaching and doing their work in Jerusalem, I don't think, till the final three and a half years. Again, though, I'm willing to be nimble. Ride loose in the saddle. Keep watching. Keep watching. Keep praying. Ask God to show you what's happening. And when we all discover who they are, the two witnesses, I doubt everyone will be thrilled. Some of you will have a test of your willingness to submit to their teaching if you're still around, if you're not in a place of safety yourself. But anyway, keep, your, keep nimble. So a lot yet has to happen, and if it's going to happen within 10 years, then a lot has to really start breaking loose in the next two to three years. A lot has to start breaking loose. The temple has to be started. The sacrifices have to be started. The, the, the beast power has to start coming together in Europe. Uh, the demise of United States and United Kingdom, Canada, Australia, all these countries. Um, in the meantime, one misstep, and we could have a, Europe, a European wide war or even a world war, World War III. But we believers, though we sigh and cry, we must trust. We must trust our God, our Messiah, to come back soon. And we're also very, very excited about that thrilled to be thinking about it because we love him so much and we love father so much they mean everything to us it's what we live for if you don't feel those feelings pray for it because it's more than just doctrine you guys it's relationship we love one another as we as christ has loved us love that love one another that way and to love god with our whole being 
the two great commandments, right? The, the love God with everything, that's number one, and then love each other like Christ has loved us. But to us believers, though we sigh and cry, we're excited, okay? So God speed that day. I want to end it here. I went a little over time. Sorry about that. I'm trying to get this below 60 minutes. Bear with me. There was a lot to cover today. Some of you probably wish I'd spoken more and longer on some of these things. Let's ask God's dismissal and blessing. Our Father in heaven, our great Abba, our daddy, our beloved daddy, whom we love and adore so much, we come before you and to Jesus Christ, to Yeshua. We just ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit to your people like you've never, as much as you've ever done before. Just pour it out on those who are seeking you. Open our hearts and minds to see. You tell us to watch. Help us to know what to watch, what to recognize what, what we're watching. Help us, dear God in heaven, to repent of our sins, to take Passover in a worthy manner, to examine ourselves, and then take the Passover and be so delighted and so happy that we are able to do that. Father, please send the son back. Please send my, our husband back as soon as you can. The king of kings, send him back. We want this all to end. May your will be done, your timing be done. Open our hearts to understand. We thank you and we praise you. We seek you. Protect, Father, your people. Protect the children as much as you can over in Ukraine and the mothers and the old people especially. Somehow let those who are starving be able to last longer until they can get food and water. Father, our hearts sigh and cry for what's going on around us. Not just there, but all around the world. And all the criminality and the violence and the, the no law and order that we see going on in this country. And all the perversion, all the perversion, Father, of what your standards are. So please come back, Jesus. Father, please send him back. We thank you. We praise you. We lift our hands up in praise to you, dear God. In Jesus' holy and righteous name. Amen. Visit the Light on the Rock website where you can view additional videos, over 600 sermons and blogs as a scriptural study reference for those who desire to have a closer relationship with God the Father and His Son Jesus Christ and learn more about His incredible plan for all mankind. We are not a church, but a nonprofit organization providing in-depth biblical studies free for all who would like to visit our site. The Light on the Rock Foundation also supports an orphanage in Kenya, providing financial resources to support their living costs and education. We never ask for money. However, any donations are greatly appreciated and will be used to support the Kenyan Orphanage and our site. Thank you for visiting. And if you find the site beneficial to you and your family, please share with others.